How about a warm round of applause for Pastor Jenny for a great message right from the heart of God? You know, I just want to jump on the back of what she said because it was my idea to have her speak just before me because she stirs my spirit. What she said is absolutely the truth. The devil, once you've made up your mind, you're going to be a Christian. The devil will accept that. Once he realizes he's lost you, fine. Now the battle shifts to making sure you're a believer, like she said, that just waits for heaven to receive healing and power and then concede that while you're on this earth, everything's going to be hard, things don't work out. I posted on social media today, and I said it last night, that there's many ministers now that teach this doctrine that God has to beat you up to fix you up, that before he takes you to the mountain, how many of you know he has to take you down to the valley? Before he heals you, how many know sometimes without the sickness you wouldn't appreciate healing? It's, that nonsense is not taught anywhere in the Bible. The message that you just heard is the absolute truth. The Bible teaches, Deuteronomy 28, if you will fully obey the Lord your God, your enemy will attack from one direction, but I will make him run from you in seven directions. God is not coming back for a weak, defeated, powerless church. God is coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle that operates in the power of God. You're going to be a part of that last day church in Jesus' name. That's why God has you here. That's why God has you watching on TV. If you believe it, can you say a loud amen? amen. I want you to see it for yourself in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy the 11th chapter. I'll give you a second to turn there. Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter. God just broke his children out of slavery, and now he's having to retrain their minds of what life's going to be like now that they follow him. Deuteronomy 11:8. Therefore, be careful to obey every command I'm giving you today so that you may have strength. Everybody say strength. So we saw it last night, and now we see it again. God doesn't want you, like you hear them say on the other Christian channels, how many of you know God wants us weak and broken? No, that's anti-scriptural, and that's a cop-out. God wants you to have strength. If God wanted you weak and broken, he would have kept Jesus in heaven. Man was already weak and broken in sin. Christ didn't come to further break man. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes, the devil comes to steal to kill and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God's not interested in beating you up. God's interested in building you up. If you believe it, can you say a living amen? amen. So, so that you may have strength to go in and take over the land you're about to enter. If you obey, you will live a long life. Everybody say long life. How many of you know we could die at any time? Speak for yourself. I'm not dying today, and I already made up my mind I'm not going to die the rest of the week while I'm here in South Africa. Can you say amen? Everybody always telling you how dangerous every place is. They found out I went to the McDonald's here in East London at 3.30 in the morning because I'm still on America time, so it's 3.30 in the morning here, but it's dinner time where I'm from, and I was hungry. People say, oh, it's not safe to go there. It's dangerous. It's not dangerous for me. Wherever my foot shall tread, I'm on land that God's already given me. I'm not finished with what God's given me to do yet, so good luck to any bullet that's assigned to kill me. Whatever devil's assigned to kill me, I plan on frustrating him for another 60 years before I go up to heaven and meet my Lord. If that sounds like you, can you say a living amen? amen? Devil doesn't get to pick when I die. Robbers don't get to pick when I die. I choose when I die, and I, death is a choice, and life is a choice. That's in the Bible. Today I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Oh, that you would choose life. I choose life. How about you? Oh, that's weak. Sounds like about two-thirds of you will be dead. I'll give you one more chance. I choose life. How about you? I will live and not die. You will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors and to you and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. Listen to this now, verse 10, Deuteronomy 11:10. For the land you're about to enter and take over is not like the land of Egypt from whence you came where you planted your seed and made irrigation ditches with your foot as in a vegetable garden. 
Rather, the land you will soon take over is a land of hills and valleys with plenty of rain, a land that the Lord your God cares for. He watches over it through each season of the year. So what's God telling his children here? God's telling his children, when you were in Egypt, you used to have to dig ditches with your foot. The Egyptians wouldn't even let the children of God have gardening equipment because you could sharpen it and turn it into weapons. So actually, even to plant their crops, they had to dig it with their feet. But God was letting them know, the land that I'm bringing you to is not like the land from whence you came. Why don't you lift your right hand up to God and say it out of your own spirit. Say, thank you, God, that where you're taking me is not like where, I'm go where I came from. See, people get saved, and they think life's going to be more of the same. The only difference is now they go to church for two hours on Sunday. That's not it. God had to tell these people, just so you know, the land that I'm leading you to is not like the land from where you came from. The land where you came from, everything was hard. You had to dig ditches with your foot. But the land that I'm leading you to, you won't have to dig at all. For the Lord sends the rain, and the land overflows with milk and honey. Life might have been hard. You might be able to tell horror stories of what it was like growing up or even what your life's like now. But I want you to know if you'll do what the Bible says, if you'll pray and receive Jesus, God's not taking you to another hard land. God's taking you out of the bondage of Egypt and into Canaan's fair land, a land flowing with milk and honey. If you carefully obey the commands I'm giving you today and love the Lord your God, and serve him with all your heart and soul. Then he will send the rains in their proper seasons, the early and the latter rain, so that you can bring in your harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. He will give you lush pastureland for your livestock, and you yourselves will eat in plenty. That's in the Bible. You yourselves will eat all you want. I don't preach on this when I'm in America because they're fat enough as it is. But I want to tell everybody that's watching me in some place that's been ravaged by famine, where you've been having the scrounge for food. Maybe you're watching me right now and you haven't eaten in two days. You will never lack food in the name of Jesus Christ. The God that fed his children in the book of Exodus in the middle of a desert where nothing still grows to this day, my God will take care of you and your children and your children's children in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You will eat in plenty. Everybody say, I'll eat in plenty. But be careful. Don't let your hearts be deceived so that you turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. If you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he'll shut up the sky and hold back the rain, and the ground will fail to produce its harvest. Then you will quickly die in that good land the Lord is giving you. 18. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates so that it would be, as it were, days of heaven on the earth. So that it would be, as it were, days of heaven on the earth. God didn't say, if you follow me, it'll be hell on earth. God said, if you follow me, it'll be, as it were, days of heaven on the earth. Me and my cousin, my cousin's a preacher, and we were in a conference. The guy opened up the conference. This is a Pentecostal, charismatic, in name only conference. The guy gets up. You know, this is how people work crowds. How many of you are going through hell? Put one hand up. The whole crowd. Then he, then he goes, he's not done. How many of you are really going through hell? Put the other hand up. The whole crowd. I don't know what Bible they have, and I don't know who they asked into their heart, but they're not doing it right. We had to stand there like two odd ducks with our hands down at our side. The speaker stared at us like we had a problem, but I'm not the one with the problem. He has a problem. He must have bought a Bible on discount because somebody ripped 30% of it out. 
I don't know what happened. I don't know how you can read. I'll make you the head and never the tail, above and never beneath, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come and when you go, and say, I'm going through hell. No, I was in hell before I got saved, and when I got Jesus, he makes it as I obey his word, days of heaven on the earth. I tell everybody that's watching me right now, as you commit to serve God today, no matter how hard the last 15 years have been, that's how easy it'll be from today until the coming of the Lord. God's not interested in seeing you suffer. God is interested in blessing you and your family in Jesus' name. I took a walk today here in uh, uh, East London, and you can hear the wind blowing outside. I would estimate it's at about, what, 50 kilometers an hour, 60 kilometers an hour wind. It was heavy wind. It was blowing my earphones out of my ear. I was trying to listen to Brother Hagen. I had to listen like this, walking down the street like I have a mental problem. <laughs> I walked to the place where I wanted to go get coffee and breakfast with that wind in my face. It was a difficult walk. I was going against the wind. When I finished eating and I walked back to the hotel, I had that same wind at my back. Now it wasn't difficult to walk. It was difficult to keep from running because that wind at my back actually would push me even when I didn't feel like, like running. And that's why you have such a disconnect between people that watch. There's people watching the channel right now. Now he makes it sound like life's easy. He's going to realize when he gets older. Well, first of all, I already am older. I'm almost 40 years old. I have a wife and a daughter. I remember when I was in Christian school, my Christian school teacher pulled me out. She said, Jonathan, I was 10 years old. Jonathan, I want to tell you something. It's not good for you to laugh all the time. I said, that's not true. Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, and a broken spirit dries the bones. That's why God said, attend unto my words. If you'll hide God's word in your heart, anytime some dummy comes and tells you something that's against the word of God, it's like an alarm goes off in your spirit. That's not true. I don't receive that. I don't have, you might be sad, but I don't have to be sad like you. When I said that's not true, the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, she did not get happy. She got angry. She said, let me tell you something. I mean, this had to be the devil. Who talks to a 10-year-old boy like this? Let me tell you something, Jonathan. You might be happy now because you're a 10, but one day you're going to get older. See, this is how people teach you. I mean, some of you had parents like that, eight years old, having fun in your house. Wait till you get older. Wait till you're paying the bills. This is what she did. So you notice I didn't have parents that were dumb. I had parents that were anointed. So my parents never talked like that. My parents told me, Jonathan, if you'll serve the Lord and live a pure and holy life, God will do great things with you. And they were right. So since the devil couldn't use my parents, he sent this bonehead who said this, Jonathan, you're happy now because you're a child. But one day you're going to get older and you're going to have a wife. Okay. Does the Bible say he who finds a wife finds a ball and chain? Or does the Bible say he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtain his favor from the Lord. One day you're going to have a wife. Yeah, but it's not going to be you, so I'm not going to have a problem. Amen. Amen. One day you're going to have a wife. You're going to have children. You're going to have a house. You're going to have bills. You're going to have to pay insurance. Remember, I'm 10. This is a demon talking. No adult would talk to a child like this unless they were anointed from hell. And then you're going to find out that life's not so funny anymore. Well, I got news for you. I was 10 then, but I'm 38 now. I have a wife. I have a child. I have a house. I have 13 full-time employees. I have more insurance than that lady will ever pay in 10 lifetimes. And the joy that I have at 38 would put the 10-year-old me to shame because the joy that I have is not from the circumstances of this world. The joy that I have is from the infilling and overflow of the Holy Ghost. For true religion is not meat or drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If you receive that today, let God hear your mighty hand clap. Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So that's where you have the disconnect with people. How can he talk like life's so easy? Because they're walking with the wind in their face. Everything seems hard. Let me tell you something. If everything's hard, something's wrong. You're not in the will of God. I would talk to any minister that's watching on television right now. If you always catch yourself saying the things I'm making fun of right now, oh, it's hard being in the ministry. There's no money in the ministry, man. People won't listen. I want you to ask yourself why you're at where you're at. Can you trace back to a time when God spoke to you and said, I've called you here? Or did you get mad at some church, take a few people with you, rent some little dilapidated building, and slap World Outreach Center, True Revival Ministries on the sign and start off on your own. If you will follow the leading of God's voice, God will never lead you backwards. God will never lead you into stagnation. The Holy Ghost always leads forward. When God called me into the ministry, I was eight years old. Didn't have much to do with it. My parents sent me up to my bedroom to change for bed. I bent over and picked up my pajamas off the bed, and when I stood up, there was an angel of the Lord on the other side of the bed. The angel, I was just quiet. The angel said, Jonathan, God has reserved you for this final period of time to be an evangelist, to call men and women that are now in darkness into the light, for soon it will be eternally too late. Do you understand? And I said, yes. I had a speech impediment. Eight sounds in the alphabet that I couldn't say right. C, C, H, S, S, H, and a number of others. Eight total sounds. You can't preach. You can't speak publicly for a living if you can't speak privately for free. When God called me to preach, I didn't even have the physical ability to do what he called me to do. But when I said yes, God gave me a tongue that now the biggest complaint I get is, you speak too fast and people can't keep, keep up with you. God gave me a new tongue to preach. When I came in contact with God, he didn't make life harder. He turned my weakness into an overflowing strength. And I tell you, the God that did that for me, he will do it for you. He'll do it for everyone that calls on his name. Life doesn't have to be hard. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and, and learn of me for I'm meek and lowly at heart for my yoke is and my burden is how do you screw that up how many of you know life's hard the Christians talk like that now if you're unsaved you're correct life is hard and life will get harder Isaiah chapter 3 says, say to the wicked, it will not go well. If you're not saved, you can call every number on the bottom of that screen and ask people to pray for you and nothing will change. Nothing changes on the outside until something changes on the inside. And only the blood of Jesus can change a man from the inside out. But once that change is made, glorious change. That same Isaiah chapter 3 says, but say to the righteous, all will be well. Lift both hands all over this room and lift both hands watching on television. I tell you, as you give your life to the Lord, fully give your life to the Lord. Today, I tell you what the Bible says. Say to the righteous, all will be well. You look at my blue eyes and listen to me as I tell you this. Your tomorrow is going to be all right. For you might have been in Egypt right now, but you're not staying in Egypt. The Lord is leading you to Canaan's fair land. And the land where he's leading you to is not like the land from whence you came. So rejoice and be glad, for the Lord is going to take good care of you. If you believe that, one more time in here. Put those hands together and give that God a mighty, mighty shout of praise. Now, notice what God said that you will have strength to go in and enter the land. Nobody goes to their promised land uncontested. There's giants in every man's promised land. See, that's the doctrinal screw-up that dead churches make. They teach that Canaan is heaven, and so Egypt is the earth, and God's leading us out of, of this terrible life 
And one day in heaven, we'll be in the land that flows with milk and honey. But they have a problem because Canaan had something in it called giants. And there's no giants in heaven. You're not going to need prayer for breakthrough in heaven. There's no devil in heaven. There's no demons in heaven. And there's no stupid people in heaven. And those are the three sources of all of life's problems. Can you say amen? Actually get excited if somebody's demon possessed. Because you can cast a demon out, but you can't cast stupid out. Amen. And so since all those things are gone from heaven, there's no giants. But on this earth is where Canaan is. And there's giants that contest the entry of every man's promised land. But I'm going to tell you right up front, before we close this session, you're not going to be deterred by the giants in Canaan. God is going to give you strength to enter your Canaan now, not in the future, right today. You're going to drive those giants out and settle the land that God said belongs to you. If you believe that with me, shout amen like thunder. So how do you get the strength? How do you get the strength to enter Canaan? You just shake yourself? I'm, I'm, no. The armor and weaponry that God gave us that gives us strength to go in and take the land are the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I did an introduction to it yesterday. Today I'm going to teach on three of the gifts. Two in this session because they go pretty much hand in hand. And then I'll do another one uh, uh, in the next session. This one I'm going to start with is the easiest one to flow in. God means for every believer to operate. This is not strength he gave to apostles and prophets. This is strength that God gave, as our brother shared in the beginning. The reason you see ministers operating at such a higher level of blessing than the average person is because the people are casting all their battles. So the minister is exercising his faith for like a hundred people and reaping the blessing for fighting those battles. But that's not how God wants it. God wants you to have strength to go in and enter the land. And you'll receive that strength now in Jesus' name. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. What is this power that God gave? The gifts of the Spirit. There's nine of them. Diverse tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. These are vocal gifts that speak under the power of God. Discerning of spirits, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. These are revelatory gifts that help us to think like God. And then there's action gifts or power gifts. Special faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles. I want to deal with tongues today. People say, why do you Pentecostals make such a big deal about tongues? Well, we don't. The Bible does. If you read in the book of Acts, they were pretty obsessed with making sure that not only were people saved, but that they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. In fact, turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts the 8th chapter. Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, verse 5. Philip the evangelist went to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miracles that he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Skip down to verse 14. But when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But when Peter and John laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on the people. So notice there was a visible sign because Simon the sorcerer could see an evidence that they had received the power of God. He exclaimed, let me have this power too so that when I lay my hands on people, they'll receive the Holy Spirit. Skip over to Acts chapter 19. 
Here it is again. Acts 19. Verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Notice these people were already saved. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. You'll never receive what you don't have taught and preached to you. That's why I'm teaching and preaching on it. You don't get anywhere just bashing Christians over the head saying, you know, we need more of the power of God. Shame on people for not operating in the power of God. That doesn't do anything except make people feel bad. Tell them what it is they're lacking and show them how to get it. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say a better amen? amen? Good. That first amen was like Canadian. That second one was African. I liked it better. Amen. amen. What baptism did you experience then? And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Turn over to Acts chapter 2, back to the left. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was this, a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. Probably sounded like it sounds in here right now. Can you say amen? How many hear that wind blowing outside? The Bible says they were meeting like we were, about as many people as are right here. And all of a sudden there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on them. And everyone present. Everybody say everyone. everyone. And everyone present. So anytime you hear a dummy say that this was only for the 12 apostles, the Bible doesn't say the 12 apostles began to speak with tongues. The Bible says everyone present. Six years old, 14 years old, 17 years old, 73 years old, pastor, janitor, roofer, construction worker, employee at McDonald's. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Ghost. And then what happened? Same thing as Acts 19. They all began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They all began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians 14, 1. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also covet the gifts of the Spirit. See, people get into 1 Corinthians 13 as if Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 12, and then said, you know what, though? None of that's important. Just walk in love. No. You don't have to pick. You go to a buffet, you don't have to pick one food. You can have everything that's in this book. God has prepared a table for you. You can pull a chair up and eat everything you want because he wants you to have it all. Let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire earnestly the gifts of the Spirit, especially the gift to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues, listen to this, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Verse 5, this is what the Bible says. I would that ye all spake with tongues. 
How many people does God want to speak with tongues? I just think it's a, it's a gift for some people. Well, you're wrong. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues. Go down to verse 13. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. 1 Corinthians 14, 13. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. What then shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, and I will pray in words that I understand. Verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than ye all. You know, there's the greatest golfer, maybe in history, at least in the last 30 years, is Tiger Woods. When you find out why somebody's great, the mystery goes away. When you find out that at the age of five, he would wake up at five in the morning to hit golf balls for two hours before school started, then it stops seeing like he's lucky, and you realize why things work for him. So when Paul, that evangelized all the known world, starts to tell you what his regimen is, brethren, I thank God I pray in tongues more than ye all. Then you're get, he's not bragging. He's giving you a clue why he could go into any city and blow it up for Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. End of the chapter. Verse 39. So, dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. Well, if the Bible says don't forbid speaking in tongues, I think churches should be pretty careful about what they go about forbidding, putting a sign up, no speaking in tongues in the main sanctuary because we believe that that will scare away new believers. First of all, just because you have idiots doesn't mean you have to throw out the doctrine. You throw stupid people out that are intent of doing their own thing. But you never throw the Holy Ghost out of the church. No church, listen to me, I'm quoting Dr. Lester Summerall word for word. No church has ever honored the gifts of the Spirit and shrunk. Any church that moves in the dynamic operation of the power of God doesn't grow. It explosively grows. And I tell you, God is going to shake the continent of Africa with a fresh outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. God is going to shake the UK, Birmingham, Brighton, London, Hull City, Ireland. God is going to shake Europe one more time by the fire of the Holy Ghost. And God's going to shake America from New York City to Maui, Hawaii, from Wasilla, Alaska, down to Laredo, Texas. God will shake the nations of this world one more time. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If you believe that with me, take 20 good seconds, clap those hands one more time, and give God a mighty shout of praise. Somebody shout a living hallelujah. hallelujah. How's God going to shake it? Not by might. Not by power. Not by planning meetings. I saw that 21 of the world's evangelical leaders met together for how they could evangelize Africa. You don't know how to do it. You sitting around a table planning won't get one thing done. We're to pray and the Holy Ghost will speak to us when we pray in the Spirit. Let me tell you three things about tongues. Number one, speaking in tongues is one of the only gifts of the Spirit that benefits you. In other words, the gifts are given to profit with all, profit the church. But the Bible says there's actually a residual benefit for the one who speaks in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks mysteries unto man but speaks directly to God and builds himself up, strengthens himself personally. It says in the New Living Translation, why do you think there's so many believers? They write me all the time. I'm on television on this network almost every day. I need help. I need help. Pray for me. Pray for me. I need help. I need help. Pray for me. I need help. I need help in Uganda. I need help in Kenya. I need help. See, I have a problem. Why do you need help? When the, you know, I almost feel like giving that answer the king gave in the Old Testament. If God can't help you, what can I do for you? I had somebody ask me, Jonathan, I need to know what my purpose in life is. I said, did I create you? 
Go kneel there and ask God. God did it. Jesus made a promise in John chapter 14. I will not leave you helpless. And then he told you how he was going to help you. I will send another whose name is the Holy Ghost. That's why, why do you think that your family doesn't mind if you become a Christian as long as you go to a dead church? But as soon as you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, and if you start speaking with tongues, all hell will break loose. Then why can't you go to a normal church? Why do you have to go to that church? Because the devil, think about it. If having enough churches in a country would save a country, South Africa would have been raptured 100 years ago. America, you have to drive by 19 churches to get to the church you're going to. Life Church, New Life Church, Newer Life Church, Newest Life Church, True New Life Church. But if the church doesn't carry the power of God, they have no ability whatsoever to annoy and frustrate and destroy the work of the devil. But on the flip side, one believer, you don't have to outnumber the devil's people, one believer that gets full of the Holy Ghost stays full of the Holy Ghost and makes it so there's an overflow of the anointing coming from them, destroys the devil's plans with ease wherever their foot shall tread. You will be that type of believer in Jesus' name. You will be that type of believer in the name of Jesus Christ. You will not be weak and defeated. You won't be having to call an 800 number and toll-free number. Ask, God doesn't want people praying for you. God wants you to learn how to pray in the spirit and get answers from heaven if that's what you're going to do put those anointed hands together one more time and give God a mighty shout of praise <laughs> say it out loud say tongues strengthen me personally you know all those songs that they sing in America and Canada and Europe I'm weak and broken Lord if you notice it's all from people that are from denominations that don't have the Holy Ghost and then the worship leaders in full gospel churches bring them in, don't know the difference. If you make a choice to live life without the Holy Ghost, you can call every number at the same time on the bottom of the screen in three different phones and have three people pray for you at the same time 24 hours a day. You will get your rear end kicked by the devil 24 hours a day regardless of how many people are praying for you because the method God gave to strengthen you and give you the victory is not for other people to get anointed and lift you up. It's for you to make a decision. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 92, I will be anointed with fresh oil. Then what did Pastor Jenny say? Paul gave Timothy a specific instruction. Pray always. Stir up the gift that came on the inside of you. Not that God to stir it up. You Stir up the gift that came on the inside of you when I laid my hands on you. So the person has a responsibility to keep the gift stirred up. You listen to some ministers, they don't have any testimonies after 1992, 1996, 2002. Why? They received something from God, but it stagnated and they lost it. When God gives you a gift like he's going to give you right now, you then make a decision to pray in the Holy Ghost. And as you pray in the Holy Ghost, you stir up the fire of God on the inside of you so the fire never goes the fire never goes low. Your fire will never go out in Jesus' mighty name. Say it out loud. Tongues strengthen me personally. That's why the devil fights speaking in tongues so much. I don't believe in that. I don't think you have to do that. Who cares what you think? The Bible teaches it. I said the Bible teaches it. You could line 10 men up in front of me that are all ministers, and I could look in their eyes and tell you which ones have the Holy Ghost and which ones don't. People that don't have the Holy Ghost, you just look at there's nothing there. Hello, folks. I'm just going to share a couple thoughts with you today. I'm not going to take you up. There's no, no, I'm talking like people 23 years old. <laughs> Hello, brethren, as we're here today, what happened to you? Did you die? <laughs> and it's not about shouting and energy, but at the same time, there is a divine energy that is loose from the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Romans 8, 13, if that same spirit 
that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He shall quicken your mortal body. Tongues are an avenue for personal strength. You'll never be weak. You'll never be defeated. Why do you think Peter and John made a special trip to that place that was in citywide revival? They said, wow, that's great. They said, have any of these people received the Holy Ghost? No. Okay, we got to go then. Because them watching other people get healed, them listening to good preaching is only going to get so far. They need to carry on the inside of them what we carry. Why do you think it was Peter that made the trip? Peter knew what he was before he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Peter denied Jesus before three girls at a campfire. Big fishermen. They asked if the Vatican really has his bones, like they say they do. I saw him. Peter was six feet two in an era where the average man was five foot six. Big old man. Thought he could take a swing at anybody. Oh, they're coming to arrest Jesus. Just start hacking ears off. It came time to stand for God in front of three young girls. Aren't you Jesus' disciple? Shut the blank up. He cursed at them. But after Peter got filled with the Holy Ghost, not three girls, 3,000 mocking men. These people are drunk. And Peter stepped forward from the other disciples and said, listen to me. Some of you are saying these people are drunk, but it's not so. It's only the third hour of the day. No, what you're seeing now was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last day, saith God. And he preached one of the greatest sermons you'll ever see, rattling off scriptures from memory with no time to prepare the sermon. The anointing of the Holy Ghost, when you start to stir it up through the gift of speaking in other tongues, it will turn you from a weak, defeated bum into a champion more than a conqueror for Number one, tongues strengthen you personally. And I'll add to that. Tongues will not only strengthen you personally, tongues are a gateway into the rest of the gifts of the Spirit. When you pray in tongues, you can't do it for long. You don't have to try to operate in the gifts of the Spirit when you give time to praying in the Holy Ghost. You'll pray in the Holy Ghost. You'll start thinking odd things. I should buy this stock. I've never even heard of that company before. When you stir the Holy Spirit up, he starts to speak to you. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say a better amen? amen? Number one, speaking in tongues is for you. Number two, I want to deal with, now that's tongues with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then there's the gift of tongues which is different than your prayer language. That's where the confusion comes. That's where all the people don't understand. Anytime somebody speaks in tongues, they'll write on the Facebook comments. What's the interpretation? The interpretation is, go watch somebody else on Facebook. Can you say amen? Because you don't have to interpret your own tongue. But the Bible says the gift of tongues. Nobody interpreted in Acts chapter 2. Nobody interpreted in Acts 19. But the Bible says there's a separate gift of tongues that then there should be an interpretation. Can you say amen? amen? But the gift of tongues can also function by itself because every gift of the Spirit, it's like the nine candles in the temple. Though they all come from the same source, they all can function separately from each other. So where do you see the operation of tongues functioning separately in the Bible? The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And all the men that were around came when they heard the loud noise. Now, people in a room can't make enough noise to draw 3,000 people. So number one, you know the noise was supernatural. Number two, they list off like nine different languages and say we all hear them speaking in our own tongue and magnifying God. If there was Koza here, uh, Zulu, Yoruba, up in Nigeria, English, Spanish like my wife, and four other languages, and we were all speaking those languages at the same time magnifying God, nobody would hear God being praised in their own language. They would just hear noise. Because everybody's speaking in a bunch of languages at once, you don't hear anything. 
Can you say amen? That's why at the UN they have to wear headsets for the interpretation. They don't have the people all just yell it out at the same time. Not difficult to understand. So the manifestation, the Bible doesn't say they were speaking in their own language. The men said we hear them glorifying God in our own language. Can you say amen? I'll tell you an experience I had in the state of Vermont in the United States. I had a prayer meeting on Sunday night that I led. I just felt to. I taught on what I'm teaching you right now. This is back when I just got married less than a year. And I, uh, I taught on prayer, and then I gave time to pray. So I said, let's pray. I said, everybody that's filled with the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. Everybody that's not filled with the Spirit, just pray in your own language. And I began to pray in the Spirit because people are nervous. You know, they don't want anybody to hear them, so I just figured I would pray in the lake, and then it would drown them out, and they wouldn't have to be so timid. It's not easy to get Americans to pray. So I started to pray. That's my prayer language. Now, anybody can hear that that's not Spanish. But there was a lady from Puerto Rico, a Spanish island in the Caribbean. She got up from her seat in the back, walked forward to the altar, and knelt down and began to pray. After the service, my wife was talking to the pastor. And the pastor was a sarcastic guy. He liked to make jokes. And so he said to my wife, my wife's Spanish. Have you been able to teach your husband any Spanish? You've gotten married? She said, I've tried, but he can't learn any. And that woman that was from Puerto Rico said, what? My wife said, just what I said. I've tried to teach my husband Spanish, but he, he, won't, he can't learn any. She said, when he started to pray, I heard him saying perfect. Stop trying to figure me out with your head and receive me into your heart. Now listen, I don't know, I can't speak Spanish fluently, but I would know enough if I was speaking Spanish that I was speaking Spanish. And how come that Spanish lady heard me speaking in Spanish and my wife, who has Spanish from her, as her first language, never heard me speak in Spanish? That lady was a Roman Catholic that had never been to a Protestant church. And as she sat there, and I wasn't like anything she was used to, when I began to speak in other tongues, the Holy Ghost told her, and she heard in her own language, stop trying to f*** with your head and receive me into your heart. And she came up to the altar and gave her life to Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't say, it's not like they teach in those other churches, that those were languages so they could be missionaries. No. They were all speaking under the power of the Holy Ghost. And they heard them because it's a supernatural utterance. Can you say amen? amen? Lift both hands to the Lord and close both eyes. Say this out loud. Thank you, Father, that right now you are filling me with your Holy Spirit. That these gifts will not just be something I know. They will flow through me. Now with your hands lifted, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you've not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, pray in your language. Koza, Yoruba, wherever you're watching from, pray in that language in Jesus' mighty name. Pray for about 15 more seconds. Stir up the gift. Stir up the Holy Ghost in here in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. We're not ashamed of the Holy Ghost. We're not ashamed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Father, we don't want less of the Holy Ghost. We want more of the Holy Ghost. Number one, in Jesus' name we've prayed and everybody said. Everybody said. Number one, your prayer language, speaking in tongues, personally is for you. Number two, there's the gift of tongues that touched those 3,000 people or that Puerto Rican lady in Vermont. And number three, there's tongues with interpretation of tongues. Tommy Hicks was an American evangelist that had the opportunity to go preach in Russia back when it was the Iron Curtain. None of those people had ever heard the gospel before. As he was preaching, what he didn't know, you know, he was an American like me. People say, do you know any other languages? Uh, we don't even really know English if you ever listen to an American speak. We have our hands full with that. We have our own little warped version of English that we speak. So Tommy Hicks didn't know any Russian. So they had a, a lady interpreter with him. That lady was a communist who was so steeped in communism 
that she would not translate what he was saying about God. So when he would say, Jesus is Lord, she would say in Russian to the people, Stalin is king. When he would say, there's no one like God, she would say, there's nothing like communism. He didn't know anything about it. You can fool man, but you can't fool the Holy Ghost. That's why when churches lean on natural strength, the devil runs them over with ease. But when churches lean on the power of the Holy Ghost, they run over the devil with ease. Because the devil can stop man, but you can't stop the Holy Ghost. When she said it the third time, Tommy Hicks all of a sudden felt to speak in tongues, which is a no-no when you're preaching a crusade. You don't just start blurting out in tongues to an auditorium full of people that don't even know Jesus. But he, he knew he had to yield to the Spirit, start speaking in tongues. As soon as he starts speaking in tongues, the interpreter lays the mic down, and the lady ran out of the auditorium. Well, now what's he supposed to do? He can't go into, back into preaching. He doesn't know Russian, has no interpreter. So he figures he might as well just keep speaking in tongues. And he continues. They said at about the eight-minute mark, the whole auditorium stood up, lifted their hands, and as one came to the altar and in Russian began to call out to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. But he didn't know what was going on. He went out and found the interpreter. And he said, what are you doing? What do you think I'm paying you for? You can't just leave me up there. I don't know any Russian. She said, sir, I would have been happy to stay there with you. But you said in perfect Russian, sit down and shut up and don't say another word the rest of the time I'm here. And then you begin to speak in Russian for eight minutes telling that Jesus is the Messiah. That lady could fool him. That was the devil's last attempt to keep the Russian people from receiving Jesus. But when you have the weaponry and strength of the Holy Ghost, hell can't make a plan to stop the child of God that carries the fire and the power of God. I want to do two things right now. If there was ever an hour to make sure, not just that you're saved, but that the fire never goes out, that time is now. Jesus is coming soon. The first thing I want to ask you to do, everyone watching me in Nigeria, that you sleep with people you're not married to. As I'm preaching, you know on the inside, if you were going to stand before Jesus Christ right now, you would not be ready to meet him. You would meet him as your judge, not your savior. This is no time to entertain sin. I want you to call those numbers at the bottom of your screen. Call the one that corresponds with where you're at. Africa, United States, England, call the number now. You can call on the name of the Lord and be saved, but you must do it right now. Call that number. I'm not passing over this. I want you to be saved. I came here for you. Jesus paid the price so that you don't have to spend eternity in hell. Secondly, I want everybody in this room to lift their hands, and I want every believer to lift their hands watching me at home. Do this. Put your left hand up to God and put your right hand on your belly. The Bible says, In that day, rivers of living shall flow out from within. As I pray right now, I release the anointing for that promise from Jesus Christ to come to every believer right now. I command that fire to baptize you, and that fire will never go out. Be anointed with fresh oil. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost into your spirit right now. In Jesus' mighty name. If you're filled with the Spirit, begin to pray in the Spirit right now. If this is the first time you've received, just begin to let it bubble up from your stomach. In Jesus' mighty name. Begin to pray that out right now. Begin to pray right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Receive ye the gift. Father, move like a wave over the continent of Africa right now. Let him receive in Somalia. Let him receive in Kenya. Let him receive in Uganda. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Let a new generation of British people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. And sweep my nation of the United States. Sweep my nation of the United States. Sweep my nation. In Jesus' mighty name. Speak that out. Speak it out. Speak it out. 
The Bible says with trembling lips and a stammering tongue will they praise me. If it starts with that, yield to that, God will give you more. Yield your mouth to the Holy Ghost. There's nobody right now. In Jesus' name. Now lift both hands and begin to thank God that you've received that precious gift and that fire will never go out. And the third thing I want you to do is this. You know, you don't have to get out of the anointing to do this. You should actually do it in the anointing. If you yield your giving to the Holy Ghost, if you'll learn to follow the leading of the Spirit in your giving, God will lead you to riches. God won't meet your needs. God will lead you to an overflowing cup. Every believer, ask the Lord right now what he would have you do. So it won't be a mistake. God will take that money and multiply it back to you in Jesus' name. Go to the phones right now. I can't wait to hear from you. Call in. We want to connect with you. I'll see you again today. I love you. God bless every one of you in Jesus' name. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen.